Ephesians 3.12. In him and through our faith in him, we dare to approach God confidently. Here Paul describes the nature of faith by three very significant words. We dare to approach and confidently. It is a great thing to approach God as the judge who is truly and horribly angry at sin. Here again, the mere historical knowledge deters us unless we have determined that the Son is our leader and propitiator, and that through him we are led to the Father. This acknowledgment is the trust of which we have been speaking. Likewise, Romans 5.2 says, Through him we have access by faith. And Hebrews 4.14 and verse 16, Having such a high priest, let us come with confidence to the throne of grace. From this passage, we learn both that this confidence is presupposed in prayer and that faith in similar passages must be understood as confidence. But many cry out in opposition because they do not understand this very worship of God, namely faith, as being involved in prayer. And they imagine that there is no sin in doubting whether we were received by God or heard by him. But how great a sin this is and how harmful to us is seen when there is a genuine spiritual struggle because it rejects the promise of God and calls him a liar. Acts 15.9 Purifying their hearts by faith If faith only refers to knowledge such as even the devils have, this statement will be utterly inane, but it is evident in this very passage that the argument pertains to justification, and it is established beyond debate that hearts are not purified by the righteousness of the law, but in another way, namely, if they believe that they will be saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can add a mountain of testimonies in which the word faith is used to denote trust, such as a woman, great is your faith, Matthew 15:28. Again in Luke 7:15, 7:50, your faith has saved you, 2 Chronicles 20:20. 20, 20. Believe and you will be established. In statements of this kind, it is apparent that faith is called a trust that expects consolation and help from God, regardless of how different the outward circumstances are. Yet the first and chief object of faith is always a reconciled God, according to the promise of reconciliation. Then David prays for and accepts help in war, when he has determined that he has a God who is favorable toward him. So great a variety of outward objects and perils surrounds us that there is an opportunity to exercise our faith and at the same time to grasp the spiritual blessings, as that common prayer teaches us. For after we have said, Give us this day our daily bread, the prayer immediately continues, and forgive us our trespasses. Our mind in seeking material things will flee from God unless at the very same time it understood that we are forgiven, that we have been received into grace, and thus are heard and protected. To understand many passages, it is useful to consider that faith regarding reconciliation often becomes evident in prayers and hopes for physical things. Thus Abraham sought an heir from God, and he believed the promise which assured him of posterity. But at the same time, Abraham realized and was confident that he was forgiven by God, that, although unworthy, he was received by God through mercy for the sake of the liberator who had been promised to the fathers. The promise and comfort which proceed testify that this is the force of he believed in Genesis 15.6. In Genesis 15.1, Fear not, Abraham. I am your protector and your very great reward. In this most sweetly comforting passage, God bears witness that he is favorable towards Abraham, that he is his defender, his helper, and savior. And looking at this promise, Abraham trusts that he is received into the grace of God. Therefore, concerning this faith, it is said that it was imputed to him for righteousness. Genesis 15.6, Romans 4.3 Finally, the definition of faith given in the epistle to the Hebrews testifies that the word faith means trust when it says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is evident to those who understand the language that the word substance refers to something hoped for, that is, an expectant trust. I have reviewed testimonies from prophets and apostles which are clear and which I hope will satisfy those who are skillful in judging. But I must confess that later many writers such as Origen and others have taught another kind of doctrine, an inadequate one. 
but some of the more learned agreed with us on the substance, although also they in some places spoke very well, and in other places rather unfortunately. In Augustine, from time to time, there are some excellent statements. In his De Spiritu et Litera, he says, By the law we fear God. By faith we flee to him for mercy. Again, faith says, Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. If these statements are correctly understood, they cannot be applied to anything except to trust in God's mercy. Even clearer, in the statement of Augustine regarding Psalm 32.1. Blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, he says. Who are the blessed? They are not those in whom no sin is found, for it is found in all. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, if sins are found in all, it remains that they are not blessed unless their sins have been remitted. Therefore, the apostle says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed to him for righteousness. Here certainly Augustine understands fides as fiducia, the trust by which a person receives the forgiveness of sins. And he clearly understands the statement in Genesis 15.6 and in Paul in Romans 4.3, as we have interpreted them. I also add the testimony of Bernard, which is found in his sermon on the Annunciation. He says that it is necessary, first of all, to believe that you cannot have the remission of sins except through the kindness of God. But he adds that you must believe also this, that by him sins are forgiven you. This is the testimony which the Holy Spirit gives to your heart, saying, Your sins are forgiven you. For the Apostle believes that man is justified freely through faith. In this statement, we have a clear and concise position of the belief of our churches. And similar testimonies are extant in the writings of this author. Basil also very correctly states our position in his Sermon on Humility regarding the passage, Let him who glories glory in the Lord. He says, Christ has made unto us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, as it is written. He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. For this is the perfect and complete glorying in the Lord, when a person does not bring forward the offering of his own righteousness, but recognizes that he needs the true righteousness, and that he is justified by faith alone. In Christ. Finally, let us consider the matter itself. The voice of the gospel is better understood in the circumstances of immediate struggle than when, as wicked and secure men, we listen to long disputations. How do you comfort yourself when your mind is really overrun with anxiety and fear of God's wrath? Must you not, in this consternation, flee to Christ, the mediator, and say to yourself, I truly believe that you are forgiven for the sake of this victim? Just as the gospel everywhere orders us to believe that the Son of God died for our sins, as it says in Romans 4, 24 through 25, so we must consider also this, through the Son is access to God. Romans 5, 2. Also, this faith by which you are comforting yourself is undoubtedly the trust which rests in the Son of God. Certainly one must not think like this. I already love God. I already have the virtues and merits, therefore God will receive me. So we who see this struggle and this comfort understand that these anxieties do exist, and that our minds are raised up by the trust which looks to the Son of God. And we will want to speak these things with whatever words we can, but the prophets and apostles use the term faith in this matter. In the same way, all godly people consider their daily prayer as often as you begin to invoke God, your manly, your many-faceted unworthiness gets in the way, and your fears prevent your prayers. Is any comfort to be found here? Certainly. You must not think, I already have virtues worthy to make my prayers acceptable. But you look to the Mediator, who has been given for, you, for us. You think of the passage, Come to me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Or, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Likewise, Hebrews 7.25, he always lives to make intercession for them. Therefore, you believe that your prayer is pleasing to God and is received on account of this high priest who makes intercession along with you. To believe this is certainly trust which raises up and comforts the mind. As we contend about this matter, about this comfort, we only desire to retain the content 
regardless of what words others may use. Those who differ obstruct the content itself, destroy it, and order us always to be in doubt. They even bury Christ, because they absolutely will not teach people to seek comfort from him, or direct them to use his benefits. For if faith is not the trust that looks to Christ and finds rest because of him, then certainly we will not apply his benefits to ourselves or use them. Therefore, it is necessary that by faith we understand the trust that applies to us the benefits of Christ. Thus, when we say that we are justified by faith, we are saying nothing else than that for the sake of the Son of God we receive remission of sins and are accounted as righteous. And because it is necessary that this benefit be taken hold of, this is said to be done by faith. That is, by trust in the mercy promised us for the sake of Christ. Thus, we must also understand the correlative expression, we are righteous by faith. That is, through the mercy of God for the sake of his Son, we are righteous or accepted. We know the nature of the related terms, such as love, fear, and other terms, which are the names for the emotions relating to what we have said. Such a term is trust. Nor am I intimidated by any of those foolish criticisms leveled against this term by unlearned men. Some people object that to this trust must be joined love. I do not contend against this. But when we say that we are justified by faith, we point to the Son of God sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, and we say that because of him reconciliation is given to us, and we take away the merit of reconciliation from our own good works, whatever they may be. To summarize, when we are criticized for saying in this dogma that a person is justified by faith, we are only being criticized for saying that we receive reconciliation for the sake of the Son of God, and not because of our worthiness. We must believe this as well as that the benefit must be laid hold on by this faith or trust. And the merit of Christ must be put up against our sin and damnation. And this faith or trust, which looks to the Son of God, God is to be invoked. It is absolutely certain that, this, that these statements are the very voice of the gospel and the perpetual consensus of the true church. Nor do I doubt that good and pious people have known this explanation as Paul's correct teaching and have clung to it with a grateful mind. Concerning this entire matter, matter, I appeal to the consensus of the church, that is, of the skilled and pious. I judge that the testimony of that church carries the greatest weight. Many others insanely cry and contend that by the word faith nothing is meant except the historical knowledge, and they look for countless arguments to prove that their point. But the godly remember the voice of Paul, who says in Roman 9, Romans 9.31, Israel pursued the righteousness which is based on the law, but did not succeed in fulfilling the law. Human reason understands the righteousness of works and marvels at it, but the thing said regarding the righteousness of faith is strongly it strongly hates, because they are foreign to civil matters. We should know that the righteousness of works has its place, but in seeking reconciliation there is need for a far different consolation. I have made these brief remarks regarding the word faith, which are uncomplicated and unsophisticated and in agreement with Hebrew terminology, therefore let this be the definition of faith. 1. Faith is to assent to the entire word of God, as it has been set forth for us. 2. And particularly for the free promise of reconciliation given for the sake of Christ the Mediator. 3. And it is a trust in the mercy of God promised for the sake of Christ the Mediator. 4. For the trust is an action or movement of the will which necessarily responds to assent. 5. Faith is also the power of laying hold on the promises and applying them to oneself. It quiets the heart, as these words teach clearly. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through Christ, by whom we also have access by faith to this grace. But when we speak of assenting to the promise, we include the knowledge of all the articles. In the Creed, all the other articles are related to this statement. I believe in the forgiveness of sins and the life everlasting. This is the sum of the promises and the goal to which the other articles relate. For the Son of God was sent, as John tells us, that he might destroy the works of the devil. That is, take away sin and restore night righteousness and eternal life.